In this video, we're going to introduce the, the concept of event-driven programming. Now, we've already seen event-driven programming when we were dealing with our encoders, with our Arduinos. We, we, we discovered that it wasn't a good idea to just read the encoders every 5 milliseconds, 10 milliseconds, or whatever period you wanted. But it was useful to find a way to only read them or only process them when a change happened. So only when one of the encoders went from low to high or high to low would we go and do the processing that was needed to figure out which direction our wheel was turning for our encoders. Now the reason for this is evident if we just look at the very basic of programs. Uh, the equivalent of a Hello World program for the Arduino, which is to make an LED blink. This is this is probably the first Arduino code that you ever used or ever wrote, and basically it turns a uh, an LED on and off every second. Assuming that the, that the LED is connected to pin number nine, we turn the LED on, we wait for a second, we turn the LED off, and we wait for another second again. Now, that's fine for making sure that our Arduino isn't broken, but if we wanted to do something else with this program or make a more complex program, this kind of a model w would be completely insufficient. Basically, that's because if all we do is delay for a second, we can't really do anything else during that, during that second. We're just using up processor time without any uh, doing anything useful. Alternatively, you could have a program that did something like this, which is when you push a button down, uh, the LED lights, and when you let up the, L the, the button, the LED turns off, and the program makes a, a beep. So we've assumed that our LED is connected to pin 9. Um, we we, uh, we continuous, continuously loop through this, um, this code here, and if the button is pressed down, we loop through this while loop and basically we set the LED pin high every time we pass through the while loop and we set some boolean to, to true, boolean for the beep to true. When we let up the button, we leave the while loop, we turn the LED off and we make a beep. And We haven't defined what make beep actually does, but we can assume that it does some kind of uh, beep. And then the program resumes its, uh, its normal loop through the main loop. Now it's true that we could do something outside of this while loop. So whenever the button is up, it's true that we could do some kind of something interesting in, in this section of the code here. But while the button is down, we're basically stuck in this while loop and we can't do anything else while we're waiting for the button to come up. So both of these codes are have, suffer from the same flaw, which is that they are blocking codes. The delay blocks execution of other useful programs. The while loop blocks the execution of other uh, statements that may be necessary to, to, to make a, a well-functioning program. So this is bad in general. And to get around this, we have to write our, our program in, in a non-blocking fashion. And one way we can do that is by using event-driven programming. Now, event-driven programming is characterized by events and services. An event is something ha that happens at a distinct point in time. And it's generally a change in state. So a button has been pressed, or a timer has expired. And when one of these events occurs, then control is passed to a service or a handler that takes care of whatever needs to be done when this particular event happens. So the first thing we need is something to actually check if an event has occurred. And that is known as an event checker. And event checkers are written such that we can check them frequently and Basically, they're very fast. They don't occupy much of the processor time while we're actually checking for the particular event. So here's one way, for example, to, uh, to check for a button press that might be relevant to the, to the previous example. 
In our event checker, we've defined two different variables. One is the last button state, and one is the current button state, here just called simply button state. Now notice that last button state is declared as static, which means that even though it only has local scope, it's actually persistent. So the, the program remembers last button state every time we loop through the, the main loop and every time we come into this check for button press function. So basically, we have a last button state, we check with the current button state, and if they are different, then we are going to return true from this checker. And if they're not different, if they're the same, we'll, we'll check false. And then um, uh, the last thing we'll do is we'll update the last button state based on the current button state. So the next time we, we come through this loop, we'll, uh, we'll have the correct value for the last button state. Now, there are two important things to note here. The first is that we are checking for events. Event is when a change occurs. We're not just checking for the state of the system. So for example, we're not just checking if the button is down and returning true whenever the button is down. We're only turning we're only returning true from this checker when the current state is down and the previous state is up. In other words, we're only returning true when there's actually been a change in the state, not just the state itself. The second thing to note is a little bit more subtle, which is that we only call the function get button position once. We haven't defined get button position, but presumably um, it goes off and it reads a digital pin somewhere and tells us whether or not the button is up or down, of course. And the reason for this is that we don't want to get in a in the situation where we read it twice in our checker and somehow it changes in between. So if somebody pushed the button right between when we read, if we read it twice, then we would get the wrong answer and we would potentially miss an event. So for example, we don't, down here, we just use the local variable button state to, uh, to assign to last button state instead of calling get button position again, because again, between these two statements, the button position could have changed and we wouldn't want to miss the event the next time through. So then we have to write a piece of code that can deal with with a button press. So this returns a true or false depending on if the button has been pressed and whenever it returns true we need to deal with that particular event. And for that we use what's known as a service or you could call it an event handler. For our example above, we would handle the button pressed by turning on the LED, turning the LED pin to high. We could similarly write an event checker for when the button is released, and if that were the case, we would, whenever the button is released, we would call handle button released, where we would turn the digital pin low, so we turn the LED off. And then we'd also call some function beep, which again has yet to be defined. So then we just have to write in our main loop, which is back up here, all our main loop has to do is continuously check for events, whether the button is pressed or the button is released in this case. And whenever those events occur, so whenever these functions return true, then we run off and call the particular event handler that we need to. So the key here is that each one of these functions, both our event checkers and our event handlers, have to run relatively quickly because we don't want to spend a whole lot of time in any one particular function and slow down this loop as far as going and checking for new events and checking for new uh, and, and, and handling each of those events. So the nice thing is that if we do that, that we can basically make a list of a whole bunch of different event handlers, or sorry, event checkers, and 
uh, that's all encompassed in do other stuff here. So we can have a whole long list of event handlers and each one of event checkers and each one of those has its own event handler that goes off and does some particular function in our program. So one of the more useful things we can do with with this kind of structure is in, incorporate timers into our program. And if you remember we when we said that we we're going to make something beep, we didn't actually say what this was going to ha what this was going to do. You can imagine maybe that it beeps for um, half a second or something like this and then and then turns off and continues on its merry way. So one way we could do that is to build a timer in software where we basically we know what time we set the timer in with Arduino we can use the millis function which tells us the number of milliseconds since the start of the program and we can look and see if a certain amount of time has elapsed at, and and then when it has our timer has expired now you can also do this in hardware you can use interrupts there are many many different ways to do uh, do timers, but I think explaining how it happens in software is is one of the best ways to understanding or to, to, to begin to understand how it actually happens in, in hardware as well. So again, we'll, we'll show this by example. And let's say that we, when we wrote our event handler for when the button is released, it looks something like this. We turn off the LED, we turn on, we, we turn on the beep, so somehow we, we set beep pin to high and that's connected to, to some uh, electronic device that makes a beep. We start our timer running by setting its state to running and we say that we want it to run in this case for one second by taking the current time, adding one second to it and saying that will be the end of our timer. So then we have to write a checker that looks to see if the timer is expired. And again, it's not just looking to see if, if we've gone past the time at which the timer is turning off. It's looking for a change in state. In other words, if the timer is running and we've reached the end of the necessary elapsed time for our timer to expire, then we return true. We also set the timer state to expired so that the next time we come through this this loop, check timer expired, we will return false. The timer has expired, but the event of the timer expiring has already occurred, and so we return false in this particular case. Now, if you had a lot of timers, it would make sense probably to make a class called timer and uh, make many instances of timer objects, and each one of those would have its own time when it would expire, and you could be checking these particular timers. There are other ways to do it. Um, you can make trees of, of timers and that sort of thing. You can do it in hardware as well. But again, it's useful to see how, how the timer works or to think through the logic of how the timer works in order to understand how it happens when you do implement the other methods of doing timers.